Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, for those that are just coming in, we've got some chairs at the front here that are reserved for... We can fill up the spaces at the front. If you guys want to just come to the front, just so we can fill up the spaces, that'll be great. Okay. All right. Well, good afternoon. My name is uh, Jason Haddad. I am the IT Development Manager for IT at AMP at Insurance, and I'll be uh, facilitating today's uh, talk. We uh, have a special talk today. It's on the Internet of Everything, and uh, we'll uh, basically present uh, Chris Mendes to talk through what that all means for you. Um, it, first of all, a special welcome to all the AMP visitors, uh, media, and all AMP staff and the AMP leadership team. It's only day three of Amplify, and uh, I know that it's important that we uh, keep the conversation going. Uh, you've probably heard it all day today. Continue to use Twitter, hashtag AmplifyFest. And uh, we'd like to see those questions come through and post your messages uh, throughout the talk. Uh, once the talk is finished, I encourage you all to ask some questions, either from the audience or use the uh, Amplify app. Uh, I expect that our talk will finish uh, close to about 3.20 p.m. So today's talk is presented by Chris Mendes. He's the Chief Technology Officer at uh, Rosetta. I met Chris last week at The Rocks, and he walked me through a personal insight into how he uses, inter uses the internet for just about everything that he does. So this talk is quite relevant, and I'm actually very excited to see, see this uh, presentation today. Uh, through the talk, you'll learn that the solutions adopted will be uh, applicable to what you do, and uh, I'm looking forward to now handing over to uh, Brendan Daly from Wipro. He will introduce Chris, and he's the sponsor for today. Thank you, Jason. Um, interestingly, borrowing from an article I was reading um, late last year, there's been uh, three big uh, information technology changes in the last 50 years. The first one was in the 60s and 70s with the introduction of order processing and uh, MRP systems. The next in the 80s and 90s was the rise of the internet and the coordination of value chains. And the last one which we're in now, which is you know, being brought about by the availability of technologies, the computing power, and the abundance of data in our environment. In that, in that context, it's a pleasure for Wipro to introduce uh, Chris Mendez, because he's uniquely qualified in, um, to talk about things in that area. I've had to write them all down. He's a very busy man, and I wouldn't be able to remember them all off, uh, off by heart. Um, he started as an engineer um, uh, developing embedded software for laser printers about 25 years ago or thereabouts. Um, he then worked in financial services developing web uh, solutions. He's had various IT executive roles and more recently he's moved into the area of big data. More importantly, he's passionate about helping people with real problems. Uh, he keeps his hand in in coding. Um, he's active in the maker movement, which is a very interesting um, uh, subject if you want to have a look at it later. He's a startup mentor, a angel investor and does consulting work to uh, the um, Yield Foundation in Tasmania. And more importantly that you might want to take up in question time, he used to be a model train um, enthusiast. So on that note I'll hand over to Chris. Thank you. So thanks very much guys for the introduction and your kind words. I 25 years, I feel so old, uh, So, but thank you. And thank you so much for joining me today. I actually used to work at AMP, so it's a real pleasure to come back and be able to see some old friends and uh, catch up with all of you. I'm gonna share with you today about the Internet of Everything. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what it is, why is it useful, and also what I think some of the challenges are for it. I, I really am of the view that it's a fantastic technology, but I think it's, a bit of a solution looking for a vision. And I want to talk to you about that because I think that's a theme that we're hearing a lot in the conference. I've been to all the talks and it's something that we're hearing in, in many of the talks. And, and, and I'm going to share with you why I think that and maybe what we can do about that. Um, so in order to ease you into it, I'm going to run a little video for you. Um, and it's about a project that we've, we did a bit of work on. Some of the subject matters a bit out there, but, but let's see what you make of it. Part of Rosetta Technologies' activities is working with a consortium to help agribusiness grow in Australia. A unique example of how we're combining the power of Hercules and Athena is a project that involves connecting oysters to the internet. The objective? To grow the perfect oyster. Together with our partners, we're measuring the oyster's heart rate, seeing how much it gapes, where it sits in the water column, all done with remote sensors and all fed back to us over the internet. Now that's clever, 
But when you integrate that data with other big data sets about the weather and water conditions, things get really interesting. When you bring all that together, you've got the internet of everything, even of oysters. For the oyster farmer, it's just better business. They've got control of costs and they're able to optimise production. It's just one example of the amazing potential of big data. It will give us the power to make better decisions about the way we use resources, the way we manage our economy, and the way we interact with each other. On its own, big data isn't useful, it's just big. At Rosetta, we combine data with the right technology and expertise to help change the world. In this case, to grow the perfect oyster. So that was a really fun project to work on. And I think it gives you an idea about the concept that we're really at a point now in time where we've got the technology to measure everything and to record that. And I'm going to give you a few interesting examples to hope, hopefully you know, spark some thoughts and illustrate it to you. Um, anyone guess what that actually is? No, no, it's not a brainwave. It's actually, it really is the heartbeat of an oyster. Right? I mean, who knew? They have hearts, and I hope it doesn't stop you from eating them, because the oyster, <laughs> the oyster industry really needs us to eat the oysters, right? So, you know, please continue. Um, now, this one, it's another chart, and just to give you an idea of the ubiquity of what is going on with the Internet of Everything, that's actually the power consumption of my house, measured in 15-minute increments, and put on the Internet. So one day I was pretty frustrated by the energy bills, and... Being an engineer and a software developer, I, I built the machine, plugged it in, and got it on, and, and found out, of course, logically, that my swimming pool used about as much energy as four people. It's a pretty depressing thought. Right? So, um, you know, tempted to just fill it in. Um, <laughs> and look, at some point, I can even tell you the URL, and you can go and look at when my daughter turns on the heater. Um, so, but, you know... Even you are going to be connected to the internet, and many of you are already. And you've probably seen those awfully depressing Facebook posts where people tell you that they just ran 14 kilometres. And, and I hate them. I hate all of them. Um, but you can, you can monitor your run in real time if you want to. You can actually have your heartbeat uploaded in real time. People are now measuring their breathing in real time which is kind of handy, especially if you're not quite fit and you're worried about having a seizure while you're running. It's re really handy. So, but, you know, if you're a Formula One fan, Formula One cars now are so heavily instrumented that you can actually know everything about the performance of the car and the driver in real time. And I don't know if you... If, hands up anyone who watches Formula One. I quite like Formula One. And you see the guy pull into the pit stop and two little guys run out and they put monitors on the guy's car and he isn't watching the West Wing. What he's actually doing is he's looking at the parameters of his car and that data is being uploaded over the internet back to the pit but it's also being loaded back to the crew in Italy or wherever the team happens to be based. They're doing the analytics and they're sending the data back to the car. They can even tune them in real time. So this is the power of what we can do today and we're going to talk about is that useful or not. A couple more examples, though, before I go to the next slide. That's Nest. Some of you will have heard about Nest in one of the earlier sessions, but basically it's, a, it's an internet-enabled thermostat, and you can, it can learn all about what you do and what temperature you like and when you like it. And if you're coming home early one day, you can, you can use your mobile phone and turn your heater on or turn your air conditioning on. And I think it's a, an enormous convenience, and it makes life easy. Is it essential? Mm, maybe not. But it's really nice to have. Not that I have one. This one's a bit more esoteric. I don't know how many of you have you've seen them, but the more tech-savvy of you will have seen them. That is an internet-connected light bulb. Um, you can now buy them, and your mobile phone can turn lights on all over your house. Uh, you can change the colour intensity. You can change the colour. Um, and not only that, they're smart enough that if you have several in your house that they actually form their own intelligent mesh, which is quite a terrifying thought. Right? But they talk to each other just like the Sonos sound systems do. Um, and it's, again, it's a similar thing. Now, in this particular case, it is incredibly useful. I have one guy at work who is 
quite disabled and um, he really needs to have a system where the lights come on in his house automatically because he's permanently on crutches, right? And being an incredible geek, he actually has wired his whole house. It all comes on automatically. He even has an internet controllable kettle that turns on in the morning and boils his water before he gets downstairs, which is fantastic. And this one's a little bit more scary. It's not actually internet connected yet, but it is connected. So General Electric have wired up all of their new jet engines, and they actually report their performance parameters in real time over the, uh, via satellite to GE. And this is particularly wonderful in one way, in that if you've got a problem with your engine, when you land, the parts can be ready. And that means quick turnaround of a plane. Right? And if you, if you fly with a, a particularly generous airline, if they know there's a problem that they can't fix, they can have another plane ready. Unlikely to happen, knowing most airlines, but, but it's possible. Right? So all of these are really wonderful, wonderful things. And in fact, I've been talking to some guys at Cisco, and there's an entirely new concept that they're coming up with to deal with this. Now, I'm going to hand around a toy. I've got it in a pocket here somewhere. Here it is. And I'd, I'd be happy for you guys to pass this around. You're not going to break it. That's actually a tiny CPU from a sensing system. I paid $8 for that. And it's got about eight inputs, so you can measure eight different signals on it. Uh, it's USB connected, so pass it around. Everyone can have a look. The interesting thing about that, and I'll get back to fog in a second, the interesting thing about that little bit of technology is two years ago I paid $8. It's USB powered, so it's not connected. Now I can buy a similar part for $4, and it's Wi-Fi connected. Right, so I can get that onto the internet. It's pretty powerful. So much so that one of the paradigms that you'll look at, you'll learn about if you go to the Cisco website, is this new concept of fog computing. So you've all heard about the cloud and the fact that there are these mysterious data centers out there and you write distributed apps that run across this cloud of mysterious machines. What, Intel, uh, what Cisco are talking about, in fact, is that we need a new compute paradigm that leverages that sort of technology where you don't just write apps that are distributed in a data center. You write apps that are distributed right down to what they're calling the edge of the internet, including little CPUs like that. And, and you, know, you can imagine that just writing distributed software that runs across many machines is complex enough. Writing it so that it can cater with scaling and the right parts being broken off and distributed down to packages like that is an incredible <laughs> new way of thinking. And I think it's a challenge for the software community that we're going to have to come, come to and deal with very soon. But you know, it's wonderful what we can do with technology. It's fantastic. And I've, you know, I've spent my life geeking out on it and playing with it and loving it. But is it useful? And I think that's a question that we really always have to be asking. And I'm going to share with you a few examples of why it is useful and how it's useful. And probably the most powerful example that I, I could share with you is an awesome project that we worked on called Sense T. It was awesome because of the scope of what they tried to achieve, and they are still going, so it's, it's not finished, it's actually just finished alpha phase. Uh, and rather than trying to tell you all about it, which could take me at least half an hour, I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to actually run a video instead, which is an infographic. It's really fast paced, so you have to listen, and I want you to pick up on obviously what they're doing. But I want you to also focus on the fact that they're not just talking about sensing technology. They're talking about building a business ecosystem. And we're going to come back to that theme. You heard about it a bit earlier today. And I'm going to you know, keep, come back to it later on in the discussion. So let's, let's have that video. This one's quite loud for the, for the um, AV guys. Guess what happens when you take a planet and put 7 billion people on it? They build an alarmingly complex beast we call an economy. It's how people keep themselves fed, sheltered, healthy and happy. They all look after their own little economic pieces. 
But in a modern economy, all these pieces interact in complex and sometimes unexpected ways. Petrol supply affects transport costs, which affects fresh food availability. Water quality affects seafood production, which affects restaurant prices. Weather affects energy use, which affects our environmental impact. But we don't have all the numbers on this stuff and the numbers we have are all kept separate. If we don't have the data on how the machine is working now, how do we make it work better? With a growing population, how can the machine keep up without people breaking the planet they're sitting on? In Tasmania, Sense T has been creating a solution. We collect all the data we can from the whole economy, historical, spatial, and real time. We help people get sensors in place to get more data and get it straight away. We mix all that data together like a mathematical smoothie. Then, with careful privacy protections, give it back to businesses, researchers, governments and communities. They can see connections they never knew were there, build powerful apps, see where waste is happening, do research on the cutting edge, inform consumers like never before, make existing systems more profitable and better for the environment, create new sustainable systems, then share what we've learned in Tasmania with the rest of the world. We could even share the Sense-T system to help other parts of the world with their challenges. Sense-T collects, relates and distributes data about our whole economy so we can live sustainably with all this planet's inhabitants. So that's an audacious scope. It's a global scope. It's, it's at the very minimum economy wide. And the idea there is that they wanted to build a system that gathers all of this data and an ecosystem for sharing that data and making it useful. It was an economically sustainable ecosystem. Um, and I'm going to hone in on a couple of points for you now. We're just going to unpack that a little bit. Um, so I don't know if you remember what she said was that we don't have all the numbers on that. And that's a really important thing. Most farmers, in fact, today don't have a lot of instrumentation. So what they're doing is they're, they're working based on you know, tradition and, and a great deal of historical knowledge about their land and just stuff that they've grown up with, basically. And uh, you know, some interesting statistics that I learned about farmers, average age of a farmer in Australia is 59. Right? Um, one other interesting fact that came out during this project was that we actually produce twice as much food as we need. Right? So we can feed this planet. Where does it all go? So more than half is wasted. Now I think that's quite, quite a travesty. Right? So understanding what is going on is so important. Right? And you know, so logistics is actually a very big problem. So what we found was that you know, farmers don't have instrumentation. If they do have an irrigation system, what they're doing is actually having to tap into that, and usually the irrigation system manufacturers don't want them to do that. So at best, they'll get a chart on a screen somewhere, and that's all the data they've got. Sometimes a farmer will go out and buy um, a weather station, and they'll stick it in a corner of a field, and what that's telling him is the conditions in the corner of a field. These guys have got huge tracts of land, to quote Monty Python, and they, they really aren't measuring what's going on with it. So they don't really know what's happening. And there are so many things that they can do once they do have those numbers. So what's happened with that sensing technology that you, you, you've been passing around is that the price of installing some of these things is quite high. And with that tech, the cost of sensing has come down by a factor of about 100. So what that means is that they can have 10 times as many sensors for 10 times less money, or they can have 100 times as many sensors. And when you've got 100 times, what that means is you can put a sensor near every plant. So, you know, a lot of the work I did, strangely, coincidentally, was with vineyards. Um, can't think why. And, um, you know, what these guys were doing was starting to measure the soil moisture and the soil temperature and what was happening actually at the grapevine. Um, and this allows you to do all sorts of clever things with watering techniques to control the flavour of the grapes, but also more importantly for our environment, they could detect um, and early predict the presence of fungus, for example, that really would damage a crop. And it means that they could use less chemistry. And I think that's a fantastic thing for the environment, but it saves the farmer money. And that 
really is important. Now, obviously, the other side of this is that they got to share that information with their neighbours, right? And that means that communities could learn to share resources, like scarce things like water, right? So they could actually work out who needs what and when. And, you know, you, you heard in the video with careful privacy protection. So that, that's a really important, right? Um, one of the other facts, though, is that obviously the farmer themselves doesn't have the maths he doesn't have the data skills to take readings from 2,000 sensors on his farm and work out when botrytis is forming on his grapes. So what he's had to do is leverage other people's brains. Keep that thought. We're going to get back to doing that. The only way you can leverage other people's brains with your data is to share it. And this is an important point, I think, for every business. It's not just about farmers. This is really relevant, and especially relevant, I think, in the finance sector. Um, and it's happened before, and particularly, I think I was in a talk earlier where I was talking about the fact that this whole data sharing and ecosystem things happened before in the stock market. And so one of the great things about this program is that it really spoke to the idea of data sharing and the need to share data to allow innovation to happen. And it's, it's a call to action that I'm going to put to you guys today as well. So two more examples, and then we're going to talk about some problems. And I'll try and keep this quick, because I'm, I'm running over time. So, connected everything. I met a lovely guy. His name's um, Gavin Smith. He's the president of Bosch Australia, and through, through this project, in fact, that I was working on. And Bosch have made a global commitment. The CEO of Bosch has made a commitment worldwide to connect everything they do to the internet. Most people don't know Bosch. They make home appliances, they make drills, they make industrial equipment, they make power systems, they make automotive parts, and if you own a car, you own something from Bosch. Almost every vehicle on earth has a piece of Bosch in it. Um, now, why would you want to connect your washing machine to the internet? I don't know. But the interesting fact is that he sort of decided that he would do it, why? Because it only costs a euro. So they're adding one euro to the cost of everything they make, and it's all internet connected. But let's think about something really useful. So recently, Bosch Australia, and this is why, why Gavin's photo's up there, and he told me all about this project. Bosch Australia ran a project with a large energy company. I can't tell you who it is yet, um, but there'll be press releases soon. And they instrumented their fleet of 1,000 electric vehicles. And they saved that company. By doing that, they, they watched what the drivers were doing. So, you know, being a lead foot in an electric car is a really bad idea because you can get a great ride out of an electric car because they could accelerate like, like nothing else. The problem is that it wears your battery down pretty fast. So one thing, they could give real-time feedback to drivers about their driving style to help them go further, but also it actually prevented drivers from leaving the base if they didn't have enough power in the car to get to the destination and back again, right? Which is pretty handy. That's got to save some money. But on a much more impressive scale is the concept of virtual power plants. Now, in Australia, we don't have the level of renewable energy that they have in Europe. And one of the things that they started doing in, in Bosch is making what they call a virtual power plant where they instrument an entire power grid. One of the problems with, with uh, solar and wind is that that power is going to be injected onto the grid when it's there, pretty much whether you like it or not. And that can really cause problems for a grid. It causes it to become an unbalanced um, supply. Under, in the old world, uh, and where you're generating power, it's done on demand, right? So you can spin up in a power station more generators as you need to, but you can't really control it with solar and wind. It's there. At least with the wind turbines, you can actually turn them off. You can turn the blades. But what they did was they actually said, OK, we're going to install battery banks. So someone earlier today was talking about Tesla. So they've got all of these big banks of batteries. And by measuring all of this in real time, they're actually able to say, OK, I'm going to put that battery bank onto the internet, uh, onto the power grid, and I'm going to make sure that that solar power, the excess energy that I'm generating right now, gets sucked into the batteries. And later on, we can push it back out again. Even more interesting is in some cases where you hook up, your, and you've got to sign up to this program, you hook your electric, power up, uh, electric car up when you get to work, and 
it, it charges, but also if there's a sudden big surge in demand, they can actually take power back out of your electric vehicle. It could be a bit of a bugger if you have to go somewhere urgently, but such is life. Um, and that can also be used to balance the grid. And I think this is a really incredibly useful way uh, of using the Internet of Everything. So one last example, and then we're going to talk about problems. Um, this guy is Sean Sibley. He is the managing director of Thomson Reuters Commodities and Energy. I, I really had the good fortune to meet him in Canary Wharf recently. And what they're doing with the Internet of Everything is actually predicting the price of grains and oils. And it's the most accurate prediction service or forecasting service available, which is why they're also one of the most profitable business units inside Thomson Reuters, which is a tough gig right now. That sector is hurting. Um, so they, have, they basically use the same sort of technologies that I was talking about earlier with Sense-T, and they're harvesting that information, and they're using it to forecast price. They also have internet-connected drones that they fly out over fields, and they take pictures of wheat and barley and not just invisible, but they take pictures in, in infrared and ultraviolet as well to look at what the plants are doing, and they can actually get a lot of information from that. One of his comments, which I thought was fantastic, was that, in fact, they throw away a lot of information as well, because not all data is useful. And I think that's something worth keeping in mind. Um, now, so they gather all of this information. What do they do with it? How do they get those prices? And this is where, I think, you know, it's a real challenge for the rest of us, where we've got this big data. They employ 120 PhDs full-time to crunch the numbers and to come up with new methods. And I think that's a real problem for most of us because we just don't have that available to us. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. That's one of the challenges of this Internet of Everything and the big data era. These things are really merged issues now. So let's talk about challenges. I've got four to share with you, and I've only got two minutes left, so I, with your permission, I'll run over a bit, if that's all right. Um, so I'll start at the bottom. Platform Wars. We are at the peak of the hype cycle, and that means it's a gold rush. Every man and his dog wants to get in on this, and the reason is that they want to stake their claim, right? They want to own this thing. And so, you know, you've got Cisco, Bosch, Google, Apple. Uh, they're just the big players, all with embedded operating systems to run on those wee CPUs that I've passed around, um, or an Internet of Things platform that sits in the cloud and takes the signals from those things and records them and then gives you the data back, right? Um, and, in fact, there are about, I think the last count I made, there was at least 30 players in the IoT platform war right now. And one of the problems with this is that it makes it really difficult for people to want to invest. You know, rolling out something like this is expensive. And what the only answer to this, in fact, is time. Uh, these players have to be consolidated, eliminated, and we need the emergence of open standards. Um, whoop, back one, security. Security is a real issue, um, and as you can imagine, by the time I've put my jet engine on the internet, it becomes hackable. I don't know if you, uh, if you saw recently a great article, and it sort of just came and went. It was a blip on the front page of the Herald about a man in the US who was arrested by the FBI when he got off a plane. Dan's, Dan's nodding his head. This was an awesome story, and, and you notice we've not heard anything about it because he claims, and I don't know how true it is, that he was able to hack into the flight computer of the jet by accessing the game console system or the video console system under the seat in front of him. So, you know, we're really opening ourselves now with everything being connected all the time to a real incredible world of hacking. But apart from sinister sort of things like that, just data theft is an issue. Data is not just, it's not just about the data itself, it's about the intellectual property that the data can tell you. Any share trader will tell you how devastating it would be if someone in the world other than his own company knew what he was doing, share trading, because his secret source is being revealed. Now look, the same thing happens to farmers, right? So if I have a special method of watering my grapes, I don't want Fred next door, who's also a, a, a vintner, to know that, right? It's a real problem. 
I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about the last two. And we're going to move off this slide. So logistics, um, there are four areas there that, that are worth thinking about. Networks is a real problem. And just very quickly, every time you want to put a device on the internet, it needs an address. You need to know where it lives. And we're running out of addresses. So current internet addressing technology can address 4 billion unique addresses. It's a real problem. By 2020, it was predicted by Gartner, I think just the other day, that we would have 24 billion permanently connected devices. Bit of a shortfall. So there's a new technology or a new, a new standard called IPv6 that addresses that, right? So we, we suddenly we're going to go from 4 billion to, in fact, the ability to put a sensor on every molecule on the planet 100 times. So it's enough to be getting on with. So I think that's a solved problem, right? That, that's, that, is, that is a real, real answer, actually. It's the truth. But I think something that, that is more, more devastating, I think, for us, and in Australia in particular, is bandwidth and penetration. And I read a report recently, it's called the Akamai State of the Internet Report. Has anyone read that? Yeah, yeah most of you would read it. And I've got to say, it's, it's an absolute essential read if you're an insomniac. So <laughs> you've got to rush out and get it. Um, but so I've taken a bullet for you, I've read it too. And what it tells us is that in Southeast Asia, so I'm not talking about the world, just in Asia, Australia is ranked 44th. Right? And if we went to an Olympic Games and came back and, and we were 44th in the medal tally, there would be a Senate inquiry and probably bloodshed, right? There would be a burning flags and... So, you know, I'm not here to make political commentary about the NBN, heaven forbid, but I would ask all of you to consider our standing globally. And you'll, the usual suspects were up the top, Singapore and Japan were right up at the top of that. So and I, you know, I think we owe it to ourselves to be there. We are limiting our capability. Um, management's a big problem as well, and I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna speed up now. So we, we've got uh, a farmer with 2,000 connected devices on his farm. Anyone who runs an IT shop here will know what a management nightmare that is, and we just don't have a solution for that problem right now. I wanna talk to you now, moving quickly on to sharing and using that data. So, you know, I talked about the 120 PhDs, and I think this comment from Bill Joy is self-evident. The only answer to the problems, I think, that we're going to have with big data and with the Internet of Things and the data that it generates is for us to learn to leverage the innovation power of business ecosystems. And we heard a lot about this earlier today. And what that means is that you have to be willing to share you have to be willing to share data, and you have to get clever about how you do that. There's plenty of precedents for this. It is not a new idea. Stock markets have been sharing data for decades, right? So it's doable. Um, but not only do you have to be willing to share data with your ecosystem, including your, your, your competitors even, what you have to be willing to do is share what your problems are, and you, even more, I think, more risky than that is that you have to be willing to stand up and share your vision with those people. And that's, I think, a really important thing for us to take away from this conference. And then we do get back to the problem of, well, just are there enough of these people? So is science, technology, engineering and maths the answer? And Bill Shorten, in his budget response, suggested 100,000 places were needed. I, I, this is not a plug for the Labor Party. I just happened to catch my attention. And I think the answer is, yes, we need these guys. But what we don't need to do, and this is another thing I heard earlier today, what we don't need to do is lock them in an IT department. Because, and I, who here is from an IT department? There's quite a few, Adam Lee, yeah? Craig? No, I know, I know. <laughs> just as well, yeah, just as, that's right. So what we want to do is get those people working with us. And one of the reasons why is that technology on its own tends to cause this sort of problem. It's the hype cycle. And IoT right at the moment is... So go and look at this on Wikipedia if you've never seen it. We're at the peak of inflated expectations. And we're looking into the trough of despair, right? Disillusionment. Um, and we have to get over this. We, we have to find ways to shorten this cycle. And I think the only way to think about it 
is this. Just remember, we aren't inspired by solutions. That's not going to do it for anyone. We're inspired by visions. And I think the way that we, we one of the things I've heard again and again and again at this conference, in fact, is that it's through teams. Yeah, we need the science, technology, engineering and maths, but we need to combine them with arts grads. Uh, it's analysis, synthesis, rhetoric. These are words you don't hear very often, I think, anymore. Argument and design thinking. Yes, plus science, technology, engineering and maths. And I think that is what we really need to see today. I'm going to leave you with a quote from Albert Einstein, who said it so much better than I could ever do it. Thanks very much.